It's spring, 1942. Fighting desperately to defend Britain from the Nazis, British pilots are joined in the struggle by Poles, Czechs, French and others. This is Czech Peter Strahovka, preparing for another sortie in his Spitfire 5B. These remarkable young men came from all over the world to fly Spitfires and fight with Britain. It's hard now to conceive of their daring, determination and sheer bravery. I've been telling their stories. I know I can't do them justice, but for now, two things stand out. First, how they came from such varied places and backgrounds, but melded into such a tightly knit band of brothers to fight the cause together. And second, the cold, hard fact that very few of them went home. They were killed. My name is David Daniels and for many years I've been passionate about wartime aviation and those incredible young men that flew those aircraft. Their stories, often forgotten. And the aircraft themselves, such as the incomparable Supermarine Spitfire. AD-377 was ordered as a Mark II and completed as a Mark V in the shadow factory at Castle Bromwich, where Jaguar cars are built today. She was assigned to 19 Squadron, based at RAF Ludham in Norfolk. 19 Squadron were tasked with guarding the East Coast. They flew fighter interceptions, they flew shipping patrols, they flew armed reconnaissance, dinghy searches, uh, strafing e-boats. It was incredibly difficult and dangerous flying, and they flew intensively uh, throughout 41-42. AD-377 was issued to 19 Squadron in November 1941 and was flown by a number of pilots but became the favoured mount of Peter Strahovka and he flew her on over 70 occasions including over 40 ops and throughout that winter she flew almost continually. 19 Squadron were a mixed bunch of pilots they came from all over the world and among those pilots was another Czech Rudolf Borovic. 1st of April 1942, the aeroplane was taken by Rudolf Borovic on an exercise. Uh, there were six Spitfires on the exercise, and on return to Ludham, there was a rain squall approaching from the west. So they were quite keen to get down back in the airfield. So in a trail of Spitfires, they curved around to make their approach. Rudolf Borovic, in AD 377, intent on his approach, suddenly sees another Spitfire cutting in from his right. The rules of the air are that the aircraft established has priority and in any case there was going to be a collision if nothing was done. So, no doubt with the odd curse or two, he opened the throttle wide and turned to climb away, go around and make another approach. However, on opening the throttle, instead of a lusty roar from a Merlin, there was a stony silence. Now Borovic has to work quickly. He's only at 300 feet. The wheels and flaps are down. A Spitfire in that configuration with a dead engine comes down like a brick. So Borovic did not flap. He did made all the right moves, he kept straight, kept his flying speed, tried to restart the engine, no joy. By now he'd be very low, he would have time to get rid of the hood, tighten his straps, and await his arrival on terra firma. That this turned out to be a Norfolk Broad was no doubt a surprise, but it was better than trying to stretch his glide, for example, or turn back to the airfield and spin in. But his problems were not over yet. The impact was very severe, and it tore the left wing off and broke the fuselage just behind the cockpit. The engine and bearers came away, and the aircraft settled very quickly into about four feet of water. Sliding into the water, he found there was no footing in the liquid mud and silt, and he was quickly up to his armpits. He had no choice but to pull out the dinghy and climb into that. It took nearly half an hour for him to find a way out and clamber ashore. Well, Rudolph was next observed walking down the main runway at Ariaf Ludham with his parachute over his shoulder. 
uh, with lots of choice Czech invective, with no doubt a few English additions thrown in. The 19 Squadron Engineering Officer was dispatched to examine the aircraft, and in fact she was written off the same day. However, 54 maintenance unit were dispatched to the uh, location to recover the engine, because of course the reason for the stoppage needed to be ascertained. On arrival they saw that the aircraft was already half sunk in the mud, and was only accessible by boat, and there was no slipway then. So, war time being war time, and they were not short of Spitfires, the aircraft was simply left to sink out of sight and out of memory. I got to hear about AD 377 from a colleague with whom I was working on another recovery. And uh, he said to me, David, have a look at this and uh, see what you can make of it. And all he gave me was a serial number. So I set to work, I pulled all the records, I got the accident report, I gathered what information I could about the locality. And piecing it all together, it quickly became apparent that the account as presented could not be correct. That aircraft could not be where the records said it was. Well, according to the records, the aircraft lies in Hitlin Broad, but on reconstructing the accident, uh, and from where the engine stoppage occurred, it was apparent that uh, Rudolf Barwick could not have made Hitlin Broad. And there, um, I was pretty well stumped, until, by a complete fluke, I came across a piece of local knowledge, and it was a fluke. Uh, but that gave me the indication of where the aircraft was. And as soon as I had that, all the pieces fell into place. I am confident I know where AD 377 lies in her watery tomb. I've visited the spot. I've matched up the photographs. I've matched up the circumstances. I am certain I know where the aeroplane is. The owners of the land are very keen to see the aircraft raised. The MOD have said they are prepared to issue a licence if all the conditions are met in terms of environmental damage. Before I can gather all this information together, I require a full archaeological survey. The purpose of this appeal is to raise funds for that survey, and a full archaeological survey does not come cheap. I've been quoted approximately £5,500, but without it, the project cannot proceed because we need the necessary information about exactly where the aircraft is, exactly how far down she is, and what it will take to get her out. On completion of a successful survey, we can then move to the next stage, which will be actually raising AD 377. But that is a long way down the road, and there are a lot of hoops to jump through. AD 377 is a very fine example of her breed. She is an early mark with an extensive operational history. And she deserves to be raised and flown in memory and honour of all those young pilots. With her, we can raise the profile of those young men and what they did. And surely they deserve that.